So now um, we'll move to the, the final segment of the program, which is our keynote presentations. Um, and uh, following that, we will, uh, we will move on to lunch. So um, I am delighted, actually, folks, thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, so I am uh, delighted to uh, welcome to the podium John Podesta, who is uh, so well known that I don't even think I need to tell you his title, but since I'm told that that's what I'm supposed to do, he is chair of the Center for American Progress, uh, former chief of staff, of course, to uh, President Clinton, and uh, a good friend of CSAS. John, please come to the podium. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation and CSIS for bringing us all together today for this uh, important discussion uh, on what I think of as the most important bilateral economic relationship in the world today. And I think uh, that was well displayed uh, in the panels that, that preceded uh, uh, my, my speaking here with you this morning. The efforts undertaken by the China United States Exchange Foundation, and particularly by its chairman, C.H. Tung, and by its vice chairman, Victor Fung, uh, along with the scholars on the executive committee, have produced a comprehensive report that will, I think, add to our understanding of the U.S. China economic relationship and provide both governments with an important set of recommendations, I think, most importantly that important set of recommendations for deepening the relationship. For the last four years, the Center for American Progress and China-U.S. Exchange Foundation have co-hosted a U.S.-China Track 2 dialogue, and we continue to host these dialogues on an annual basis. I've come to have the highest uh, regard for C.H. Tung's tire tireless efforts to bring our two nations closer together. Uh, he is always looking ahead to anticipate emergency cha emerging challenges, in the U.S.-China relations and to figure out what he can do to make those challenges more manageable. This economic project is one of many initiatives that he has fostered in recent years, and I have no doubt that his efforts are having and will continue to have a significant and positive impact on Chinese-American relations. It's important, I think, for all of us to follow his example, to keep looking forward, to identify new and emerging challenges in the U.S.-China relationship, and to do our part to help navigate these issues. That's why we're all gathered here today, and we have so many friends uh, in the room. The economic report presented here this morning takes an in-depth look at the many synergies in the U.S.-China economic relations, as well as the conflicts that need resolution. There is much merit in the report's findings and recommendations. As the report notes, our two nations want the same things. We both want to develop and maintain the type of sustainable economic growth that will give all citizens the opportunity to build a more prosper prosperous life. As the report also notes, the best way to achieve that goal is to combine forces. Through bilateral economic cooperation, the United States and China can unlock new opportunities that neither country could achieve alone. Working together, we can make the citizens in both nations better off. To do that, we're going to have to build a stronger bilateral relationship issue by issue, sector by sector. We'll need to identify specific steps that both nations can take to address our current barriers. This report outlines many of those steps. However, uh, the U.S.-China economic relationship is large and it's quite complex. So no report can capture these issues completely. For example, I think the report may underestimate, and I've said that to our friends, the co-authors, the impact that China's ascendance has had on job growth here in the United States in certain sectors and certain locations. It's important to recognize that changes in the global economic order create not only winners, but also losers. I strongly believe that China's economic rise has been and, and can continue to be a positive force for the United States as a whole. Our two nations are economic partners at the macro level, uh, for example, as uh, Victor Fung alluded to in the last panel, post-2008, coordination at the macro level at the G20 meetings in London and Pittsburgh and, in, and in, through bilateral channels uh, and beyond was critical in keeping the Great Recession from sliding into a Great Depression. Uh, but at the enterprise level, uh, of course, our businesses are very often competitors. 
From the U.S. perspective, the stakes of that competition are only getting higher as China climbs up the technology ladder. We welcome ch uh, Chinese competition when the playing field is level and the rules of the game are fair, but that's not always been the case. When you look at the various economic disputes between our two nations, most of our, re our disagreements are really about fairness. Our leaders in Washington and Beijing all want to make sure that the companies and workers they represent have a fair chance at success, but our two nations sometimes have different ideas about what that fairness entails. It's important to recognize that some of the barriers, uh, I think, in U.S.-China economic relations are based on real, concrete differences between our two nations. For example, a U.S.-China bilateral investment treaty that's been discussed this morning is proving difficult to negotiate because our economies are built on different market and regulatory principles. I certainly do not think these differences are insurmountable, but we shouldn't underestimate them either. Uh, to really get around our differences, both nations will have to make some adjustments. Both nations will have to take an honest look at our current economic conflicts, identify problems uh, where, uh, that, where we can and uh, should address uh, those problems as we move forward with real pro policy change. I think one of the values of this report is that it tries to at least identify uh, those challenges and provide some constructive ideas on how to move forward. One issue, of course, that causes great concern on the Chinese side is U.S. market access, particularly for Chinese direct investment in the United States. There's a perception in China, I think, that the U.S. is biased against Chinese firms. While I understand uh, where that perception comes from, I think it's misplaced. I think there are great opportunities for Chinese firms to directly invest in this nation, to build American infrastructure, to create American jobs, and generate steady and handsome returns. I think, as again, as was also noted in the earlier pan panel, there's also the ability for Chinese firms to invest here and learn best practices and take those home to the tremendous uh, and growing middle class market in China. The problem on our side is that the U.S. does not yet, in my view, have a coherent, coherent national policy on inward FDI. Uh, that's something that the U.S. government, I think, needs to really work on. Uh, two issues that cause great concern on the American side are IPR, protection, and cybersecurity. And we hope that Beijing will do more to work to address those problems, as the report recommends. Many U.S. companies are becoming more and more, I think, reluctant to share their best innovations with China because they fear their technology secrets will not be protected. Those fears make it difficult for our two nations to collaborate on high-end technology innovation in important sectors like clean energy. Uh, now more than ever, I think it's critical for our two nations to take concrete action to address these issues. Our ability to collaborate on the economic front has huge implications that extend far beyond the business realm. On clean energy and climate change, the rest of the world is really depending on us to create the energy technologies of the future and to slow the pace of global warming. The fate of the world literally, I think, depends on our ability to work more closely together and to make that transition uh, from uh, uh, dirtier forms of fossil fuels to, the, to a clean energy base uh, in the future. We've already made some great progress collaborating to develop and deploy new energy solutions, but more progress is clearly needed, particularly on next generation technologies, and that's going to require addressing some of these complex issues like IPR protection on the Chinese side, and re, uh, relaxing technology export restrictions on the U.S. side. Of course, the need for leadership from both the U.S. and China to protect the global commons and uh, goes beyond uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, the goal of ending extreme poverty and creating the building blocks of sustained prosperity, including developing new patterns of sustainable global production and consumption, will require really a global partnership but it will require a leadership in particular from the U.S. and China. People in both nations and around the world will be looking to Washington and Beijing to see what our leaders can do to move that ball forward. Uh, next month, President Obama and President Xi will meet in California, their first meeting uh, of this new leadership uh, term. This is a critical meeting, and I hope and trust that some of the recommendations uh, in the CUSCF report will find their way to the agenda uh, for the appropriately named Sunny Lands uh, Summit. <laughs> the ambassador just returned from there. Uh, in July, of course, Secretary, Kennedy, uh, Secretary Kerry and Secretary Liu and their Chinese counterparts will meet 
at the annual Security and Economic Dialogue, and preparations for that meeting are already underway. Uh, in April, the United States and China formed a special working group on climate change, and that working group is already moving to come up with new ideas for clean energy uh, cooperation, which they will present at the SNED meeting. Uh, our nations are working hard to find common ground, uh, and that makes me very optimistic that the very positive future that Minister Ma outlined uh, can come to fruition. Uh, that's also an important opportunity, uh, again, to, to discuss the very thorny issue of cybersecurity, and the, both the Chinese and the U.S. side are preparing for that as well. Another thing that, of course, makes me optimistic about the future of the U.S.-China relations is the quality of the, uh, of the people working to steer this relationship on both sides. We face big challenges, but we have great people at the helm. Our people are our greatest assets, after all. Ambassador Sui uh, Tian Cha Kai is one of those great bilateral assets. Uh, and I could not, I could not be more pleased to see him serving as China's top diplomat in the United States. Uh, early in his in his career, Ambassador Sui came to the United States for postgraduate studies at Johns Hopkins University. He took the time to study in the United States from the inside to gain a deeper a personal understanding of U.S. foreign policy perspectives. I think that experience has served him well and will concern, continue to serve him well in his, uh, in his new post. And P Ambassador Chue is often frank about the challenges our two nations are facing, but he's also optimistic about our ability to work together and overcome those challenges. Anybody who spent 100 hours in a room with Kurt Campbell knows that there are challenges, <laughs> <laughs> but they can't be overcome and we can make productive uh, movement forward. Uh, I believe that approach bodes well for his tenure uh, here in Washington. In his previous assignments, particularly and most recently as Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Ambassador was a critical interlocutor with his US government counterparts and with Americans seeking to deepen the understanding and strengthen the relationship between the U.S. and China. I always deeply, evalu uh, deeply valued the ability and the opportunity to exchange views with the ambassador when I was in Beijing, uh, and I hope to do so more frequently now that he's based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, all of us at the center are expecting great things from here in the years to come. We're very happy to welcome him to Washington. We're, we are thrilled to have him here uh, today. We're looking forward uh, both to working uh, with you, but also to hearing uh, from you so we can deepen the positive cooperation between our uh, two nations and to build mutual trust. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Podesta, for your very warm introduction and for your comprehensive summary of the uh, discussion today. I'm so honored and pleased to be invited by the CSIS and the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation to join all of you here today and contribute to your discussions. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to Mr. C.H. Tong. Thank you for all the guidance and assistance you have given me over the years. You and your foundation have done exemplary work to promote mutual understanding between our two great peoples. And your vision of the future of our relationship and your commitment to it is always a source of strength and confidence for all of us. Thank you very much, sir. And indeed, I came back earlier in the morning from Sunnyland, California. <laughs> it was a beautiful place. <laughs> uh, it's been announced that President Xi Jinping and President Obama will have their first face-to-face -face meeting in about two weeks' time in Sunnyland, California. And this is indeed a special meeting, a meeting of special significance, because this will be the first face-to-face -face meeting between the two presidents 
since we have the leadership change in China and since President Obama started his second term. This meeting has special significance because the two leaders may be accompanied by a few of their key aides, will be engaged in an in-depth exchange of their views on the strategic aspects of our relationship. And this is certainly different from a normal state visit. Because for a state visit, we have to spend so much time and energy on the formalities, on the protocol. But this is not the case for this meeting. And this meeting has special significance because it may not have a long list of what's, what we call deliverables, but it will enable us enable our cooperation to deliver much more in the future. So in many ways, this is quite unprecedented. We are confident that this meeting will be a first step or the beginning of uh, more meetings like this in the future between our two heads of state and between our two governments. It will certainly help us to enhance mutual understanding and mutual confidence. <coughs> and this mutual understanding and mutual confidence will lay a very good basis for our efforts to build a new type of relationship between our two great nations. Our two presidents have determined that China and the United States should work together to build up a new type of relationship between two great nations. So this has attracted attention from all over the world. This is indeed a new effort by both our nations to try to open up a new path in international relations. But I think we are not starting from scratch. We already have a very good foundation. In the last three or four decades, we have learned how to focus on strategic interests while managing our differences in a practical way. And in the, in the last few decades, we have learned how to expand our common ground when the global economic and political structure shifts and new situations have to be dealt with. And also in the last few decades, we have learned how to broaden our cooperation into so many fields so that this cooperation will be based on a much stronger foundation and get more broad-based support from our two peoples. Indeed, if we look at the development of our relations in the last three or four decades, we could see we are already making tremendous progress. We could take a lot of credit for peace and prosperity in Asia Pacific in the last three or four decades. It's really amazing, think about it. We still have some flash points in Asia Pacific, like the Korean Peninsula, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. But generally speaking, we've been able to maintain peace and stability in the region. And Asia Pacific is now economically the most uh, dynamic region in the world. I think our two countries could and should take a lot of credit from this. And now we are working together to respond to so many issues, from environment to climate change, from counterterrorism to non-proliferation, from trade to finance, and so many other areas. So I'm quite confident that this new type of relationship is not just an empty concept. It is quite real. It is already there, taking shape. What we should do is to 
build upon this very good foundation and move forward to give it more substance, to give it new meanings, and to make new progress. And the building of this relationship is, first of all, for the benefit of our two peoples, for the Chinese people to fulfill our China dream, for the American people to fulfill your American dream, and for our two people, peoples together to fulfill our common dream for peace and prosperity. And the building of this new relationship is also our shared responsibility to the global community, especially when we are witnessing fundamental changes in the world. In today's world, we can see that a number of developing countries are growing fast, are playing an important role in world affairs. There's a term, emerging market economies. Uh, but I think some of them are not just emerging. For China, we are re-emerging. We were on the world stage many, many centuries ago. So we are just re-emerging or revitalizing. But in any case, these big developing countries are developing quite fast and are contributing more to global economic growth and playing ever greater role in global politics and security matters. So how will the existing world order take these new poles of power in? How will the developed economies, the established powers, interact with these emerging or re-emerging powers. So if our two countries, the biggest developing country and the biggest developed country, could really set up such a new type of relationship, could really work together on so many issues, then we will set a very good example for the entire world. Then we might be opening up a new era in international relations. That is, the rising or the developing countries will be new partners for the already developed ones. And we can really join forces in the common search for solutions to so many new problems. So I think this is a shared responsibility for our two countries. And also, the building of this new relationship is our shared responsibility to the world economy. This is quite obvious. We are the two biggest economies in the world. And the prospects of the global economy are not so bright yet. So if we can work together, if we can make best use of our complementarity, then we will certainly give people more confidence for the global economic prospects. We'll certainly be better able to address the consequences of international financial crisis. We'll certainly be better able to improve global economic governance. And indeed, maybe for the first time in human history, we will have a real global market So I think it's really upon our two nations to take up this great responsibility and work together and move forward and show real progress to our people for the building up of, the, of this new type of relationship. And economic relations have always been a major pillar in our bilateral relations, and it should be a major pillar and play an even greater role in the building up of this new type of relationship. I think the study sponsored by the China-US Exchange Foundation has made the right point. We should work towards deeper e engagement for mutual benefit. This is a goal that we should try to achieve. This is the direction that we should be going. 
of course, um, Mr. Podesta just gave a very good summary of the discussion and the issues in front, uh, before us. There are always issues, maybe there are always disputes, since we have growing interdependence economically between our two countries. There's no surprise that uh, we should have some disputes, some disagreements, or some new issues to address. But I think we should still keep our focus on a growing common interest and interdependence, and to identify new areas of cooperation, to identify new areas of convergence of interests. There are so many of them, clean energy, protection of the environment, climate change, infrastructure building, and so on and so forth. And at, this, at the same time, we should work together to make new efforts to improve the global economic governance. It's not perfect. We have to reform it. We have to make it work better. And as for the disputes or possible disagreement, I think we should work together on these issues against the background of our growing common interests and interdependence. We should not politicize the economic issues too much, or we should never politicize the economic issues, because that will only make things more difficult to resolve, and that will only make our economic cooperation more difficult. So in this context, I would like to offer two small pieces of advice to both sides. To my fellow Chinese, especially to Chinese business, I would suggest that we should learn from our, our American friends a strong sense of crisis all the time. <laughs> because you are always aware of possible risks and challenges. Some of the challenges are real. Some of them could be imagined. <laughs> but you are always concerned about any possible risk, challenge, or even crisis. So that motivates you to keep moving forward to keep opening up new areas of innovation and production and enhancing your competitiveness. This is something we really have to learn from you. And for our American friends, especially maybe the US government, I would suggest that perhaps you could have some time to read the speeches Mr. Deng Xiaoping made at the beginning of China's reform and opening up. He underscored the importance of being open, of welcoming foreign direct investment. He underscored the values of more competition. And maybe this is a time for American government and business to read his teachings and find some inspiration from it. So my advice is very simple. Don't worry, be open. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we've all given him a lot of kudos, but now it's my uh, chance to welcome C.H. Tung back to the podium uh, to give some concluding remarks. But again, I think I want to uh, join all the people, I think, in the room for thanking you, C.H., for the leadership and Victor for your leadership and trying to uh, put this impressive group of scholars together to really try to uh, track and, 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 and look at where the complementarity is and how we move forward. So CH, you want to give us some, our final charge? Thank you, John. Thank you, Ambassador Choi. 
thank you for your wonderful, both of you, for your, for your very interesting and, in fact, inspirational talk to us. Um, it's been a rewarding 18 months working together with my colleagues in Hong Kong, in Beijing, in the United States to eventually produce this particular report. And uh, my good friend Matt uh, said many times there were many uh, lost nights. There was no sleep. It went on for days and days and days. And eventually, we turned out this report. And uh, uh, it, it is a good effort. It is not perfect. It is a good effort. And it, it is the, really the, 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 with tremendous spirit, uh, the, the, the team who were involved to produce this wonderful report. And in the process, we had two groups of steering committee members, one in China, the other in the United States. And because of the time differences and so on, that was another reason why there were many sleepless nights uh, <laughs> on the telephone working these things through. Uh, we hope this report will help the two countries to not just try to look at the present, and there are many issues we need to resolve, but more importantly to see where the future is, how important the relationship is, uh, how much uh, economic uh, opportunities can be developed if we really deeply engage uh, ourselves, and how many jobs can be created, and what better future can bring. Because with closer economic uh, cooperation, uh, the relationship will continue to improve. It's very natural. The relationship will continue to improve, wh which is, in fact, the purpose. I think if people People very often ask me, why is this relationship so important? Um, I, I would say this, that if the 20th century is a century that's a, uh, it's about uh, ideological differences, it's about fight for ideology, which way we should go, uh, the 21st century is about something entirely different. It's about securing energy security, getting energy security, sufficiency of food, protection of our environment, climate change, nuclear weapon proliferation, fighting terrorism, preventing epidemics or drug trafficking. All these and really other transnational challenges that the world faces today, and never in the history of nations have we faced so many common challenges all together, all happening together, and for that, it is important that the United States and China come together. Because I remember uh, President Obama reportedly having said uh, to Mr. Wang Qishan at the beginning of one of these SED meetings that uh, America alone, he find it difficult to, to try to take care of all these challenges. <laughs> Uh, the two countries together may not solve all the problems, but if the two countries are not together, no problems can be solved. So certainly in that spirit, China understands that China is looking at this similar fashion. We need to come together and work together. And this is why this, from a global perspective, this relationship is so important today. My friends uh, at the uh, forum, this morning give you a dose of why the relationship is also important from an economic point of view. Yes, there are challenges we need to resolve. Uh, the, the, the differences we have, the impediments we face to, to try to make the economic relationship go forward even better. But the fact is that nevertheless, it is an important relationship we need to treasure, we need to nurture, we need to go forward with. Uh, I do not want to repeat uh, 
a lot on, on some of these uh, areas of uh, of uh, on the economic front how we can we can work together except just to mention a few, uh, which, which, which I think are really important and at the risk of repeating myself, uh, uh, just to say these few areas. You know, China and U.S. are the two largest producers of energy and consumers of energy. And we are the largest greenhouse gas emitters in the world. And, and we just need to work together to, to make to make this world a better place. We need to work together on science and technology uh, so that we can have better efficient, more efficient energy use. We can reduce greenhouse gas, and we can work together on electric cars, on renewable energy, on carbon sequestration, on so many things that needs to be done so that our planet will be a safer place for us all. It is not about a, it's not just about environmental, uh, environmentalist going overboard. It's about real issues. Uh, Peter Seligman was saying, reminding me yesterday, you know, we live on this, on this earth, which is, is already being, being challenged by by all these environmental problems. And then we are faced with, with the emerging nations, emerging markets, developing the economy very, very fast, which demands more oil, more gas, more energy, more food. And then our population is growing from 7 billion to 10 billion people right, in the next few decades. And how do we solve all these problems? And we need to be working together. If we don't work together, we're not going to solve any of these problems. And, and certainly, I, you know, I travel across the Pacific a lot. I meet a lot of people. And I'm really heartened that increasingly there are, there, there, there are people in both countries saying, let's get on with this. Let's get on with this. And uh, I, I particularly want to say that at, at the end of Secretary Kerry's visit to Beijing last month, a joint declaration calling for specific action in this area has been issued. And a working group especially is now uh, organized under the strategic economic dialogue to, to get this process going. A sense of urgency is there, and it's wonderful that these things are happening. The other thing I thought I would mention is that I think few people recognize this, that. China and United States are the two largest producers of food in the world. We're also the two largest consumer of food in the world. Okay? And food sufficiency in the longer term is a huge issue. It is particularly challenging issue for China because we have only 7% of arable land. And also our, uh, our country is really changing. Uh, when we first started the reform opening, we had 80% of people living in rural areas. It's now about 50% of people living in rural areas. And this will continue to decline. There will be more and more people living in urban areas. And it's interesting to know when you live in urban areas, the food consumption goes up a lot. Because you live in a village, a family, you look after, you tilt your own land, you, know, you, you keep your own few chickens to... to help yourself. <laughs> and it's a very different world out there. So we are, we are consuming more chicken, more pig, more cow, more meat, more, more food generally. And these are the real challenges. And in America, my American friends tell me, hey, come to the Midwest, OK? There's a lot of land, a lot of clean water, a lot of sunny skies. And uh, you can get all these things in this country. And, and these, these are the complementarity issues. And also, th th these are long-term food issues that really needs to be addressed. And it's not just about working through one crisis from the other. Somehow, you know, uh, China prohibited imports of chicken in retaliation of something America did here and there and uh, about something else. And, 
and, and all sorts of things, uh, you know, which bits and pieces which we were trying to play with. But the most important things, looking at the longer term, how we can work together uh, to, 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 to ensure supply, steady supply on the one hand, and for America to ensure uh, economic opportunities, jobs, you solve a big problem for China, but at the same time, helping America at the same time. And the, the, these, are, I think, are the, are the real issues we, we, we need to be, to be confronting with, and, and real good long-term issues. And the other thing I want to mention, I, I think it's enough of you talked about the middle class and, uh, and so on and so forth, so I won't go into it anymore, except to say China's economy is changing from just, not, not just a world factory, it's a becoming a world market. World market which will, help, which will help economic activities within China, but also all around the world. And that, I think, is happening. And the final point I want to make is that I've noticed that uh, President Obama has talked about uh, building up uh, new infrastructure in this country or maintaining the existing infrastructure. And I also noticed a study undertaken by the New American Foundation which talk about having to spend in five years $1.2 billion, but itself can create 5 million jobs every year uh, going forward. Uh, now, U U.S. is a wonderful place. You, you, can raise, you can raise the needed finance practically at zero cost. That's what you, you, you are doing. So, you, you know, $1.2 trillion, yes, it needs to be raised. But you can do that. But to the extent China can, can come in and uh, get a better return on the investment, you know, we will be very happy. Uh, to do this, but but you know, but th these are the areas we can work together if there's a need uh, to do so. I, I mention all these areas of commonality, and uh, only because that there, it is really huge opportunity for both countries, for China to benefit from, for the United States to benefit from. Uh, so, you know, it's not just a, from a global perspective where the relationship is important. But from an economic perspective, bilaterally, uh, you can see that why the relationship is so important. Uh, 40 years, 42 years ago, since 42 years ago, eight presidents of the United States, from President Nixon all the way up to today's President Obama, and five generations of Chinese leaders have, with enormous foresight, enormous foresight, worked hard to build the relationship between the two countries. Despite ups and downs, the relationship has been moving forward. It's, it's just incredible. It's moving forward. But what is the relationship going to be in the future? The fact is, more and more people in both countries are beginning to understand how important this relationship has become for the two countries. I feel this, I, I started doing this in 2005, it's now seven years down the road. I come to the United States five, six times a year. I feel this, I, I know this is happening, okay. But we need to understand that there are, there are difficulties in the re relationship. Uh, our relationship is constrained by mistrust, strategic differences, and also by difficulties and differences in, in, in commerce and other areas. And so far, you know, we have been able just about to manage these issues, manage these areas, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, other times issue-to-issue -issue basis, Somehow, we have managed it. But how, what do we have to do to build trust? What do we have to do building trust? I think at the people-to-people -people level, we need to deepen understanding of each other's history, of each other's culture. At the government-to-government -government level, we need to really, in my view, I, I think I've, 
I, I stay in touch with lots of friends on both sides of the Pacific. We really need to have better understanding, greater understanding of each other's policy directions and policy intent, as well as each other's national interest, both domestically and internationally. And it's very interesting. I raised one or two issues. You know, North Korea, I, you know, if you think about North Korea for China, for United States of America, what is China's interest? China want to see a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. China want to see peace prevail on the Korean Peninsula. Okay. What is the American interest? United States want to see a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. United States want to see a peaceful Korean Peninsula. Actually, the strategic intent is the same. It's just how to get about this thing where, 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 where there's real differences. Now, neither, neither, neither of the two countries have succeeded very well so far in what we're trying to achieve. But at least our strategic intent is the same. So what we need to do is to find a common approach to make this thing work. So far, it hasn't happened yet. But, but once you have the similar intent, the opportunity of working together is much bigger. And this is what I meant by saying, let, let's try to understand each other's strategic intent. What's it all about? How do we work? Then we can we can work together. And there's another issue, which I was speaking earlier on privately. I, I was listening to Mike Spence talking about, he was talking about that 85% of uh, developing nations, 85% of the population uh, of the world living with the developing nations, and that, where's Mike, w w was it? He just went out. I was going to, just going to ask him. 85% are in the emerging markets. And today, for the first time, the emerging market economy is the size of, of the developed nations, similar size. And he was making the point this morning that you know, in the next couple of decades, uh, this size of economy of the emerging ma market may double or, or triple. And you, you, you think about this, and uh, I was thinking about it from an environmental point of view, from, uh, from energy uh, security, food sufficiency point of view, because there's a lot of development in the, in the eight, for the 85% of the world population. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that you know, as this economy develops, the whole world will benefit from it. The question comes in, how you deal with the world trade issue? How do you deal with the world trade issue? Because the developing nations will want to say, A, <coughs> the old ways of dealing with the world trade issue, you know, doesn't suit us. We, we want a, a better cut of this thing. You know? And the developed nation may say, ah, no, but this, this way has worked in the past. It will continue to work in the future. And, and they're, they're, they're like the, the Doha round, why it didn't work, the, the, the emerging markets and the developed nations. We can't come together. The truth of the matter is this. What we have to remember, the cake is growing bigger. The cake is growing bigger. And it gives us the opportunity to find a better way to share the cake. We can always stuck in a stalemate and not making any progress. So we have no progress on the Doha round or we recognize the size of the cake, and let's see how we can divide it better so that both <laughs> developing nations and developed nations have a way forward. In other words, it's not just about, we've done it this way in the past, we're going to do it that way. And it's not about, well, this time it's ours because we are the one providing the growth. No, it's got to be good for everybody in the world. And that's the way we should be moving forward. And that's the way we need to, to be solving many of the new problems that may be emerging. And, and, and uh, Mr. Brzezinski was earlier on saying that we, we need to, in the multilateral world, we need to find another way of moving forward because there, there are many changes that's happening. I, I raise these issues because the relationship of United States 
and China is it, really so, so important. We have so much mistrust. And, uh, and we, we need to overcome them by understanding better the issues. And it's not your way or no, yeah, my way or no way. It's about finding a common way of going forward, which is good for the whole world. That's what we need to be doing. That's what United States and China needs to be doing together. Uh, President Obama and President Xi, uh, I, I'm just delighted in, uh, that they are meeting uh, in, in sunny California. And uh, this is a wonderful thing, I think, to happen uh, at this very crucial time. The two presidents actually called for a partnership relationship and also for the building of a new power relationship between the two countries. I think that both presidents understand how, how important this relationship is. But I just want to say that in the longer term, uh, as we move towards building this relationship, an institutional arrangement is also very essential. Uh, We get there. It's going to take time, uh, but we'll get there. It's going to take a lot of wisdom, a lot of courage, a lot of determination, a lot of new thinking of the political elite. But that's not enough also of the people of the two countries. Uh, it will take time, but I think we will get there. Uh, what this study does is that uh, if the study we roll out today highlight, it, it highlights the, the, the potential of our economic partnership. If fulfilled, it can help to create common prosperity for both of our two countries and also for the common good of this world. But most importantly, if we succeed, it can give the two people can give the people of our two nations the time and opportunity to improve mutual understanding, to improve mutual trust, and ultimately to build a lasting peace and to build prosperity. So lots of work ahead of us. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, CH. Thank you, Ambassador Tsui. Thank you, John Podesta, um, for um, very um, uh, thoughtful and, and um, inspiring remarks. Um, that ends the formal program. There is now lunch. Uh, for the people here at these three tables, you can stay where you are. Everyone else, um, there is lunch in the back. At least I hope there is. I can't see from here. Yes, I think there is. Um, thank you all for coming today. And uh, we will have... Um, this up on our website uh, very soon. So uh, we are delighted you came and thank you to our online audience as well. Good afternoon.